So, 25 years ago, a middle-aged, no, youngish man, in a venue very, very, very different to this one, wrote an extremely complicated technical paper and gave it to his boss, and his boss sent it straight back with the words vague but interesting on the top. And it was, of course, Tim Berners-Lee's idea for the World Wide Web. Woo! <laughs> 25th birthday this year. And when I was 25 in 1997, I embarked on an incredible adventure into the World Wide Web with my friend Brent Hoberman. So I thought, as a sort of birthday celebration, I'd spend a moment telling you how I think it's going. You know, maybe some areas for improvement and some things that have been a right riot. In 1997, the thing that we had to do was convince people that the internet was not going to blow up. It probably seemed very strange or that I might be exaggerating for effect. I'm not. That was the challenge. People looked at us, relatively young, didn't know anything, hadn't really done anything, and here we were saying, you've got to believe us, this new technology is going to be amazing, it's going to change the world, it's going to change the dynamic between citizen and state, it's going to empower people to start their own businesses, it's going to change music, it's going to change art, it's going to change everything. And they just look at us and say, okay, but who's actually using it at the minute, and are they really going to put their credit card details into it? That was the battle. And we didn't know, we were just giving it a whirl. But we got lucky, we got some money, and we launched our website in 1998, lastminute.com. And it was an absolute disaster. <laughs> Awful. Nothing worked. At the front page, it would go like this. Jug, 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 jug. That was our big challenge, just making the website freaking load. We would sit there watching this thing go chug. No idea what was going to be on it, because it went go slowly, we'd never see. Then nobody bought anything, so I'd have to start writing testimonials from pretend customers about people that had had amazing holidays all over the world. And normally, I'd pick my friends, because that was kind of funny, and normally I'd make up stuff about them, which went pretty well until one of my best friends, Frank, rang up and said, can you stop putting these things about me and my girlfriends on? Because my mum keeps ringing me saying, how great that you had such a lovely holiday in the Seychelles with Kathy. I didn't even seem you liked her. Or another friend of mine ring up and say, I can't believe you put that I proposed to my girlfriend on some island based on a lastminute.com holiday. So that had to stop. We couldn't blag it. We had to actually wait for people to buy things, which eventually my friend Claire did. She bought a pair of theater tickets. And what she did was press a button on the website and seemingly this incredible and extraordinary magic transaction happened. What actually happened was that I saw it happen. I then physically took a pair of tickets and I bought on my bicycle and I went round and I took them to the theatre and then I faxed the theatre and then I sent something to her on an email that looked like it had come from our amazing clever database. So the internet back then was, yeah, it was, that's, that's entrepreneurialism for you. That's entrepreneurialism. So it was quite hairy. And it was the most fantastic adventure, and I feel unbelievably lucky that I had this roller coaster of a time. And even though things went up, they went down, they went all over the place. Lastminute.com grew and grew and grew, and all of a sudden we were on buses, and then we went public, and then we sold the company, and it was a riot. And I feel immensely proud of some of the things that we did. <laughs> and then my life changed completely. I did something even more lastminute.com than I'd ever done in my life. I think I'm one of the few people to have survived two crashes. The first crash was the stock market crash of 2001, when we'd just taken our company public, and then the day after, the whole market completely collapsed. And I said to the company, don't worry, this is going to be fine. If the share price goes to 10p, it was about five pounds, I'm going to dance on the desk naked. It went, it went to 12p. <laughs> Mercifully for them and me, it stayed there. That was the bottom. Anyway, that was the first crash. The second crash was a real one. And I came out of a car in Morocco, and I broke 28 bones, and I had a stroke. I then spent the next two years in hospital. As you can see, I've got a new friend. In fact, I've got an amazing amount of new friends, mostly that I get on the internet. If you ever need a walking stick, walkingsticks2u.co.uk. They're awesome. Um, <laughs> but I saw the web from a very, very different angle after that. And I don't tell you this story to make you feel sorry for me. I'm fine. I'm lucky. I've got money. I've got friends. I can walk. 
I tell you it because having seen this kind of slightly rarefied view of the web where everyone was an investor and they're all trying to invest in the next big hot young thing and trying to find the next trend and is it going to be mobile technologies or was it going to be the internet of things or is it going to be Canada or Africa or Brazil? I suddenly saw the power of the internet on a completely different level for people for whom all of the talk of the venture capital markets and how to scale a business across Europe is completely irrelevant. And one of those people was me. Because all of a sudden, when I was lying in my hospital bed for two years and couldn't really move very much, I was able to be connected to people. And I could send messages and I could talk into my mobile device and out would pop in a text message to one of my friends. Or I could slowly, as I started to be able to use my hands again, I could start to send very, very bad and very, very mistaken, misspelt emails. I believe you've, you've got very bad fingers, they're all broken, and you're very high on morphine. You can send some really funny shit. <laughs> it turns out they got a lot of gobbledygook, but also some good stuff. And I got a lot of great stuff back. And then as I got home, and I was looked after in my own house, I managed to start doing something very important, which was buy non-hospital clothes and food and all the things that you need to survive on a daily basis. So suddenly the web became something completely different to me, not this kind of fuel for economic growth, but something much more personal, something that allowed me to survive. And that's why I was really delighted to become the UK's digital champion, ta-da, um, and quite surprised because I was actually standing in my business Lucky Voice. Has anyone been to Lucky Voice? Hooray! We can have a sing at the end. Um, I was standing there and we were having some very high level conversation about whether or not we should worry about all the fact, the fact that all the Duran Duran songs had fallen out of the database. <laughs> These are the kind of big strategic decisions we face at Lucky Voice. When I got a call on my mobile phone and it was the Prime Minister, I was like, oh, hello. And he was obviously just got off the phone to Rebecca Brooks, I now discover from Nick's talk. But uh, having put down the phone on Rebecca Brooks, he called me and said, I wondered if you'd like to come, I can't do the Scottish accent, come and worry about the issue of people who aren't online. People who aren't online? What, what, all ten of them? <laughs> anyway, no, it didn't turn out that it was ten of them. It was ten million of them. And guess what? Ten million people who are also living in the diff t toughest bits of the country, lowest socioeconomic groups, and the oldest. And I started to travel about and meet people who didn't ever use the internet, and some people who had just got on the internet and had another complete sort of scales falling from my eyes. And it sounds so ridiculous. And you look like a nice lot, what I can see through the haze. Please don't repeat this outside these four walls, because obviously I sound like a total moron. But I could suddenly see, on my experience as well, from all that hospital stuff, just how empowering this tool could be if it was given the right uh, direction to people. So people really taught how to use it and how to use it to their benefit. And I started to meet the most incredible people, people that would look me in the eye and say, the internet has saved my life. And I'd look at them and say, really? Are you really sure it was the internet? That sounds a bit strange to me. I remember one of the first trips that I ever made in my official capacity, with my official gown on, obviously, was to a very, very uh, um, small estate in the middle of Bristol called Noel West. And I think I'm right in saying it's the third poorest ward in the country, and it's pretty tough in Noel West. They just stopped the bus route in there, because obviously if you're incredibly poor and you've got no money, why would you ever want to go anywhere? So they'd cut off the buses. And they'd built a media centre, which is what I was going to see. And I thought, this is, you know, I'm not quite sure about this. You know, they don't have any buses, but they've got a media centre. What's going on? But it was absolutely incredible. It was incredible because really what that media centre was doing was getting people online. But actually what was going on was that people were taking back a bit of control about the area. So there were a bunch of projects going on. But the one I really loved was I heard from two angles. One was a group of older people and one was a group of kids. And the group of kids said, we've got all these old people. They think that they're teaching us about vegetables, but actually we're teaching them how to use the internet. And then I spoke to the older people and they're like, we've got all these kids, right? They think that they're teaching us about the internet. Actually, we're teaching them about how to grow vegetables. <laughs> and what was happening was all of those things. And the older people were showing the young kids how to clean up the gardens that had all become a bit of a state with the aim of selling vegetables on their website. And the kids were getting involved because they wanted to sell stuff online that's that kind of neat, and also because it was fun to teach older people about how to use technology. And this amazing stuff was happening. Not only was the community replenishing because the gardens were all getting cleaned up, but also they had these amazing websites that were selling vegetables from the area. And more than that, the people who had now learnt about the internet were 
beginning to barrage their council and form petitions and get online and start shouting. So it was really amazing what was happening. So I was incredibly moved by all these different stories, and that's why I've been working pretty hard for the last five years to try and help more and more people get online. It's really hard. It's really tough, because it's not really anybody's priority. No prime minister and not many politicians really care about skills. I didn't realize that until I started this. But it's never going to be top priority, because there's always going to be more sexy stuff, like racehorse levies to worry about. <laughs> so it's pretty hard. And that's why I've been reflecting a lot about the internet in 25 years, and what I thought would be true in 1997, and what seems to be kind of true in 2014. And for an optimistic person, I feel a little bit kind of muted, because when I was starting lastminute.com with Brent, I really believed that this new incredible tool would shatter the old power structures. I thought maybe this would be a much more fragmented corporate world. I thought that women would have much more of an opportunity than ever before. I thought that there'd be new exciting private spaces created, and that this kind of unleash, unleashing of creativity would happen for everybody. For everybody. And instead, what I think is happening is that basically four or five companies control the web. Apple, Google, Facebook, a couple of Chinese big companies. Women are absolutely not engaging online. They're not going into technology, which is growing in importance to the economy. And they're not using the tools in the same way. And even worse, we've recently worked out that nothing is private on the internet. All these amazing things that we thought could be true like your identity, or being able to be multiple people, or share in different communities in different ways, has actually turned out to be a nonsense. And everything you do is public, and everything is shared, and everything is absolutely personal. This idea that it's anonymous is a complete nonsense. One of the things that I've learned since being a little bit more involved with the political scene, dare I say it, please don't throw rocks at me, is that part of the problem here is just an understanding and an experience in a language. So I'm going to give you a clue about what really showed this to me. I'm sure you're all aware, because you're all really smart, but metadata is something that winds me up. Because often I hear people saying back to me, well, it doesn't really matter, because it's just metadata we're all collecting, whether it's Facebook or whether it's the government or whatever. We're just anonymizing all this stuff. It's not about you. We don't know about you. We know about the metadata, the anonymous stuff. We know when you called, who you called, and who you are. But we don't know what you said. So I'm like, OK, so just, just, just let's go with me on this one. Say I want to have an abortion, right? And you know it's me, and you know I'm calling an abortion clinic, but you don't really know what I said to the abortion clinic, like I'd like an appointment at 10 o'clock. Well, that's the really interesting piece of information in all that information, isn't it? So it does really matter. It's not because people are bad people. I don't believe that politicians are all bad people. I don't believe that all the people making all these decisions are bad people. But I just don't think they really understand it very well. And that's a big blooming problem. So I look back now, and I look back right back to Tim's paper, which was all about just creating a way for people to talk to each other. And he talks about this very powerfully. He wasn't trying to create some big commercial success. He wasn't trying to create something that was particularly grandiose. He just wanted people to be able to collaborate in a different way. And then I think back to the excitement of 1997 when we were starting our company, and how we thought maybe the world was going to play out differently, that this unleashing of creativity was going to happen, and this empowerment of every single person. Surely, the internet, the web, is the most effective tool we can give anybody, anywhere in the world, whether you're a Senegalese farmer or whether you're living in the middle of the Noel West media, um, whether you're in the Noel West uh, ward in Bristol. But it's not happening. So that's why I need your help, because I am an optimist, and I'm not a very good entrepreneur, but I still pretend I am, because it sounds kind of fancy. And I was thinking, well, OK, it's all very well banging on about this stuff and feeling a bit depressed. But what can we actually do about it? So I've got three things that I'd like you to do, please. Firstly, can you please find someone in your family or in your community that can't use the internet and show them how awesome it is? It doesn't mean they have to become a total nerd and spend all their time online and not talk to their friends anymore and become completely addicted to a whole load of things they shouldn't. It might mean they can save £170 a year, which we know is a fact. It might mean that they're more likely to get a job. It might mean that they'll get better results at school. So if you could do that, that would be really fantastic. Secondly, maybe think about don't don't use all the big platforms every single day. Find the different ones. Don't necessarily always go to Amazon. Find the small local British retailer that's trying to make his way that is maybe available online. Go into the third or fourth or fourth 
fifth, sixth, seventh levels of the search results, not just the top three or four. Explore the web properly. Don't just have it fed to you. And finally, please, 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 it's your data. It's about you. It's not anybody else's. Make sure you think about where you're putting it, how you can keep it. Don't always just sign up to give it over. Sometimes you might feel like it. But it seems to me we make this stuff a bit too complicated. It's your data, not anybody else's. This is you. It's your interactions with whatever you choose there to be. I think you're going to make a massive difference. And if you could tell another whole bunch of people, then we can start to make a really big difference. Tim has launched this year something called the Web We Want campaign. You may have heard about it. And this is what he's trying to do as well. He's trying to get a kind of bill of rights going for the internet. Not sure if he's going to be able to do it in the way he wants, because it's really hard and really ambitious. But if we all just think a bit about how we're using this incredible tool and make it really powerful for the people that haven't yet felt its power, and take it back a bit, take it back to what we want it to be, then I think we can go back to a place in 1997 where the excitement was, where it felt like a real brave new world was being created. So I'm still optimistic, but I just think we need to stop sleepwalking into a different kind of world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.